Hi there, everybody. Welcome to the Rift Online Church, Building God's Kingdom in You. Tonight we're going to continue our study of the book of Judges in chapter 12. So if you could turn your Bibles to uh, Judges, the 12th chapter, we'll get right into it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for it falling on good ground. Thank you for even setting a watch over my mouth that I would say nothing untoward or incorrect, but that I would speak from your heart, Father, and bring a word that in season that would help your people to walk closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now for the last uh, almost three months now, we've been, we've been studying the book of Judges and talking about how the book of Judges, even though it records events which occurred during the Old Testament period, during the law, it still tells us a whole lot about how God relates to his people even under the covenant of grace and teaches us about the grace of God and our responsibilities under grace. And with that said, uh, let's start at verse 1. We're actually continuing the story from last week uh, where Jephthah was thrown out of his house. He was uh, one of the sons of the previous judge was actually the firstborn, but he was the son of a harlot. So his brethren kicked him out, and he had to go across the river and, and go live elsewhere until Israel got in trouble. And they went looking for him to get his help because he was mighty and he was a leader and all that. They just didn't like uh, his mama, apparently. But he had surrounded himself with some vain people. And as we saw in that chapter, he had some vanity to himself. And that vanity cost him. Namely, that he made a vow to God that he would sacrifice the first person who came out of his house when they came back victorious. And that happened to be his only daughter. And uh, that's a terrible thing. And people often make these very rash promises to God and, and don't realize that God just might hold you to it. And now we're dealing with with the the aftermath of the victory because a lot of times you, you you will obtain a victory, especially if it's a situation where you were the one that was rejected or you, you did, somebody was you know not treated right or they weren't the leader everybody wanted. And, you know, it's like the Bible says, you know, the the stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And and that happens a lot in life in general, and it happens in the kingdom quite a bit, and. Very often, you'll find that there are consequences and repercussions of that victory. And starting at the first verse, it says, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said to Jephthah, Why did you pass over to fight against the children of Ammon and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house upon you with fire. Now, he just set them all free. And they're coming to him to burn his house down with him and his people in it. That's gratitude for you. And, and this is something sometimes you're going to have to deal with, where there are people who will not appreciate you, who will not like you. They may even reject you, and they may run to you when in time of trouble. But as soon as trouble's over, they may very well resent you. Because deliverance came through you and not through them. Because this was all about pride here. They wanted bragging rights. They wanted to be along, along for it. They weren't interested. They apparently weren't too interested in fighting uh, until it was over, which also happens. A lot of people don't want to be involved in something until it's uh, until it's already successful. And that happened. That also happens a lot. And you see it all the time. The person says, I always believed in you. Yeah, where were you? <laughs> where were you all that time? And they're totally absent from your struggle and they want to partake in your victory. And, uh, and in some cases, they will resent the victory. And it says, Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not deliver me out of their hands. And when I saw that you delivered me not 
I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Why then are you come up this day to fight against me? So the truth comes out here. He did send for their help, but they just weren't interested. But now that there's some bragging rights to be had, and it's not just bragging rights, but also understand that when you have a war and you kill 10, 20, 40,000 men, there's some spoils to be had. Anything they had in their camp is yours. What they had on their person, even if it's just their armor, it's worth something. It can be melted down, turned into something else, and never mind anything else they might have had with them. Because something you have to understand, because we don't really think of it this way. Uh, an army, especially in, in the ancient world, and this is still true to this day, they say an army marches on its stomach. And in those days, they brought their meat on the hoof, so to speak. So if you had an army of 40, 50,000 men, behind that army you had a bunch of people who were leading a whole bunch of cattle, sheep, goats, whatever it was they liked to eat. And so you'd have this big herd of cattle that if you defeated that army, that was yours and anything else they had in there. So this was also about wanting the spoils. And that principle doesn't change just because we're in the modern world. A lot of times people want the spoils and victory. Didn't do anything in the warfare. Weren't involved in the struggle. Wouldn't pray. Wouldn't fast. Sure weren't with you when you when you're shut in in the church, you know, uh, three nights a week. Fasting and praying. But they want to partake of the spoils. And that's something you got to expect. You can't be shocked by it. And we got to learn not to be so offended by it. Because it's human nature. People do that. It isn't right. But don't be surprised by it. And I remember many years ago, someone I heard someone say, to be disappointed, you have to be surprised. And it's true. And if, if you understand that people are going to do this, you're not going to be as surprised. So you won't be quite disappointed. And I'm not saying that you should expect everybody to, to be this badly behaved. That's not the case. I'm not telling you that. What I am saying is be emotionally prepared for it. Don't let it get to you. Especially if they come against you. Remember, if God just delivered this terrible enemy that they were scared of out of into your hands, you don't got to worry about those fools. And so in verse 4, it says, Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, You Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. So there were, some, there were some taunts and ridicule here. That the men of Gilead, even though they were brethren, they were also of Ephraim. They were referred to as fugitives because they, they lived across the, across the river, apparently. And, they, and we'll find out later they even talked a little different. Some of them spoke differently. But they treated them, they called them fugitives, as if they were criminals. And... We can, you know, we can argue that maybe you shouldn't fight and kill people over an insult. But uh, if you already came to burn somebody's house down with him in it, and you start hurling insults at a bunch of armed men, you can probably expect a fight. Be foolish to expect otherwise. That's another thing we had, we just had not learned in today's church. We do all kinds of things, and we don't expect consequences. We think that being sage is a, is a get out of jail free card, that there that there's no consequences and repercussions to what we do, and we're and it's amazing that we can come to think believe this because life continually proves to us otherwise. Galatians six verse seven tells us, "Be not deceived; God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap." And as the old saying goes, don't start nothing, there won't be nothing. But they came there and they started something. And it says, And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, 
And it was so that when those Ephraimites who were escaped said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, then he said unto him, Say now Shibboleth. And he said Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. Forty two thousand men died over this. This didn't have to happen. This was an unnecessary conflict. And likewise in the church, you got all kinds of strife, even church breakups and church divisions and all kinds of nonsense that happens over conflicts that weren't necessary. Something we got to learn is not to be jealous when God uses somebody else to work the deliverance. And something that God taught me years ago is not to not to envy someone else's equipping, not to not to resent when God uses somebody else. Especially when you're going to get to to benefit from the victory. It doesn't make any sense, but a lot of times because of our pride, because we want recognition and, and so on and so forth, the human tendency is to resent it. And you'd see that all the time. I used to see that all the time in, in, in churches where you know if God used somebody else in prophecy, somebody, you know, they'd have an attitude. He's God, he's in charge, it's okay. You know, if, if they flow better in the prophetic thing, so what? Now, if they flow better than you because you don't fast, you don't pray, you don't really see God, that's on you. But on the other hand, if it's just a matter that they, they're just gifted that way and you're not, don't sweat it. Relax. Stop stressing. We're not judged by God based on the, the, the size or the scope or the scale of what we do in the kingdom or how important it looks. We each judged by how faithful we were by what he gave us to do. And something we got to understand here about this particular dynamic here, this, this, this incident, is that Jephthah was a Gileadite, but he was an Ephraimite. And there was, there was this continual, uh, it was believed, and, and, and the Bible does support this uh, as far as uh, this story, there was this continual resentment uh, even between, within, just within Ephraim, between the Gileadites and the other Ephraimites. And the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were always jealous of each other. Never mind that they're all the sons of one man. They're the, the sons of Joseph. I mean, sure, they're all the sons of Israel, but they all came from Joseph. And something you got to understand about jealousy is jealousy always has murderous tendencies. Envy is a thing that will get you fighting fights you don't got to be in. Pride will always get you involved in some kind of conflict that you didn't need to be in, and sooner or later you're not gonna you're you're not gonna want to be in. Because sooner or later, and it, it happens to just about everybody, you end up in a conflict that you really bit off more than you could chew. And that's exactly what happened here. 42,000 men dead. Over something that really didn't have to happen. And then it says, And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite, and he was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. We're not even told which city he was buried in. Just one of the cities. And what we're going to see here in the rest of this chapter is a quick succession of judges that don't last very long. And there's a reason for that. I believe in uh, it's uh, Proverbs 28, verse 2. It says, For the transgressions of a, of, a, of a land, many are the princes thereof. When there's a lot of transgression, when there's a lot of sin and backsliding and nonsense, 
you're going to see instability. And this is what happened to Israel. Even though they're, they're, they still had judges, nobody was lasting long. This mighty man, Jeff, the last six years. And it says, and after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had 30 sons and 30 daughters, whom he sent abroad, and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. And some might wonder if he only lasted seven years because he got his, his sons foreign wives, which he weren't supposed to do according to the law. And it's something that very often we like to do in, in the church as leaders, that we have this tendency where we just we do what we want to do and we do things our way. And a lot of times we do things in a way that's contrary to Scripture. And we'll look to justify it. And I've heard preachers do it again and again and again. They'll say, well, it's not your place to say that. But they'll say, you know, I'm the leader here and God put me in charge. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that God is justifying every single thing you do. It means you have a responsibility to do it right. I remember the other, just uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I had seen this video that was apparently making the rounds on in social media. This pastor's preaching, and he's preaching, uh, addressing the issue of homosexual marriage and homosexuality in general, how the, the church deals with it. And he starts saying this stuff, and at first it starts like he's going to say something right, and before you know it, it goes way wrong. He starts pointing out that, you know, we're going to condemn hom the homosexuals, but you look in the half the choir is homosexual in a lot of the churches. So many of the worship leaders, and they start naming all these things that go on in the church where it's in the church and we don't deal with it, but we want to deal with it out in the world. We want to condemn it out in the world. And then he starts making this case, and, and he almost got it right. It's right to point out that the church isn't dealing with it. But what, what he ended up saying was that basically that what it amounted to was that because it's in the church, we shouldn't be condemning it at all. And we got to, you know, that you can't win people over by insulting them or offending them. And that's not the case. The gospel has always been offensive. You know, I got half a mind to, to call that pastor up and, and uh, remind him of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The fact that there's that mess in the church doesn't mean that we're supposed to put up with it or be tolerant of it or, or, uh, Treat it as if it's okay or it's, you know, everybody sins and that, that whole nonsense because that didn't exist in the early church. We go and do things a different way. And, and the thing is, he, in a way, he kind of told on himself. He said the reason why, the, why they're in the choir is because it's good for business. If they can sing good, they can sing well, and it sounds nice, it's good for business. And that was the bottom line, that, that what he was preaching was good for business. Which leads me to the question, and I challenge everybody hearing this to ask yourself about the decisions you make in life or in ministry if you are in ministry. Do you make those decisions because it is right or because it's good for business? Is it convenient? Now, don't get me wrong, you know, man with 30, 30 sons, it's not always easy to find, uh, find wives to 30 sons. In fact, uh, among the Jewish people, they have a, a saying, a man owes three things to his son. And uh, the first of those is to, uh, to give him a home. The second is to give him a trade. And the third is, is to give him a wife. And that's quite a trick to do that for 30 sons. And uh, and we could look at that, and especially uh, Western society, we tend to be pragmatic. We do what we, we got to do. 
or at least what we think we got to do. And it, it, what ends up happening is because we did what we felt we had to do, the truth is we just didn't trust God. We didn't trust him to get it done, so we went and did it our way. And that one verse says a whole lot about the, the character of his leadership. Because if he did that in his house, it makes you wonder what else went on while he was judged. Makes you wonder. And it says that he died and he was buried in, in Bethlehem. And then verse 11, after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel. And he judged Israel 10 years, so he lasted a little longer. And it says, in Zebul Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried in Ajalon in the country of Zebulon. And after him was Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Parathonite, judged Israel. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on three score and ten ass colts. And he judged Israel eight years. This guy had a lot of kids. And it's interesting that, he, that they mention his nephews. Cause apparently it looks like he took care of them too. He judged Israel for eight years, and it says, And Abdon, the son of, of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died and was buried in Pirathon, in the land of Ephraim, in the mount of the Amal Amalekites. And so tonight, tonight I also want to, to talk to you about legacy. A lot of times we're, we're so wrapped up in, in doing whatever it is that we're going to do for the kingdom while we're alive. We don't give much thought to the consequences and repercussions that what, of what we did and what's, how it's going to affect other generations. And part of the problem, and, and we see it here, we see this pattern of these, these judges that don't last long. And don't do, apparently, at least as far as the Bible is concerned, don't do in really that much that's worth mentioning. I want you to consider the fact that there are no idle details in, in the Word of God. And all it has to say about this guy is he had 40 sons and 30 nephews. They, they, they apparently uh, were well off, they, they rode on ass colts, which was a kind of a, a bit of a, was, it, was, I guess, considered a good thing at the time. And he judged Israel for eight years. That's, and then he died. And they tell you where he was buried. But it doesn't tell you what he achieved, what he accomplished, what impact he had on the following generations. And all this because of, of the vanity and the pride of the, of the previous leaders. A lot of times we're just looking for for a particular victory. There's a degree of deliverance that we want. We want to just be free of this debt, or we just want to be free of this particular disease or illness or affliction or, uh, or what have you. And we want to be free from that. And we never get free from us. And then what inevitably happens is that it taints the legacy. Very often we don't even consider the influence we're going to have. And the truth is a lot of times we don't have that much influence. That's a hard thing to say, but the truth is, I mean, the, the numbers aren't lying. In America in particular, of, uh, new converts to Christianity... 5% are still practicing Christians one year after conversion. After five years, only 1%. Now, given that Jesus said, whom the Son is set free is free indeed, it, may, it makes you ask the question, were these ever set free? And if the gospel that we preach and teach doesn't result in a genuine conversion that lasts,
it is a fearful thing to think of the gospel the next generation will preach. So I want you to consider in, in all your struggles and your challenges and the, the things that you're going through and, and the things you want victory over and the vision that God has given you if you have one. I want you to consider the impact all those things will have when you are gone. And in the book of Hebrews it says, you know, by it he being dead yet speaks. And I've asked on Facebook uh, last week, what is your life? Will your life speak after you're dead? Does your life speak beyond your own purpose, and your own circumstance, and, and your own uh, desires? An honest answer to that question will tell you a lot. Yeah, you know, especially over the last year, I've run into a lot of people who they want to know more about the prophet or they want to hear from God. They want to be used in prophecy. And a lot of them wonder why they don't hear from God. And the truth is, the main reason they don't hear is a lot of them, they just, they don't want God. They want prophecy, they don't want God. And because their heart is not in the right place, they tend to be selfish. And I'm going I'm to finish with this. If you want your life to leave a legacy that's going to last, if you want your testimony to be everything it could be, you got to learn not to be selfish. You got to learn not to be vain. You got to let aside the pride. You got to lay it down. There's a reason Paul said, I die daily. One of the things I found over the years is uh, I don't ever hear from God more than when I'm praying for other people, than when I'm fasting for other people, when I'm when I'm seeking God on someone else's behalf. Those are the times when I hear from God the most. And and I challenge you this week to deliberately set aside some time in prayer and even in the study of the word to, to solve somebody else's problem. Not necessary to come to them with a solution and try to tell them how to live their life. But rather for it to be an exercise in getting used to thinking of others. Because a lot of times we're, you know, we're searching through the Bible and commentaries and lexicons and all that stuff, trying to find an answer to a question we've got. Or an answer to a problem we've got. I dare you to do that for someone else. And I, and I believe with all my heart, you will start to hear from God in a whole new way. And the times we're living in, we can't, we can't afford to, to be like Jephthah and his successors. So I challenge you to do, try that out this week and see what happens. God bless you and God keep you.